If you're curious about making beer, things just got a lot simpler. Today, I'm gonna to show you just how easy it can be to make this delicious, hoppy citra ale. Like many home brewers, I got my start making my own beer with a kit. But a lot of the beginner brewer kits out there either try to dumb things down way too much or forget about some key aspects that make beer actually taste good. I know my first few batches were straight dog dookie. So I'm gonna share some tips I've learned in the past 10 years of fermenting and brewing to help you make the best tasting beer possible in your first batch. It all starts with the beer kit and I'm using the Claw Hammer one gallon beer kit. Claw Hammer actually provided this kit for me and I gotta say it's one of the better kits I've used but I'll talk more about what makes it great in a minute. Inside the kit comes a fermenter with an airlock, all the ingredients for a citra pale ale, and cleaning and sanitizing products. Some things that you'll need beyond this are a stock pot, you might actually already have one, but ideally a two gallon pot to give us some extra room to work with. Another thing you'll want is a scale and a thermometer. Hopefully you have those as well in your kitchen, but if not, I'll have some links in the description with some good affordable options for all of these. The last thing I would recommend is a bottling kit. You can always save bottles from beers that you've bought and then buy some caps and a cheap bottle capper online. Or Clawhammer has a bottling kit as an optional accessory, which is a nice convenient way to ensure you have everything you need to package up this beer in the end. So with everything in hand, it's time to start making beer. There's many ways to make beer, but probably the easiest way is to use some form of malt extract for the main fermentable sugars. Malt extract is basically condensed wort, AKA unfermented beer and can either come in liquid malt or dry malt form. But for both, you really just need to add water to make wort. And while it is convenient, by itself, it's really not that interesting. Thankfully, this kit also uses some steeped grains to add complexity and depth to the beer. The start to any good recipe is with water. Water makes up 95% of beer, so a water choice is actually quite important. My recommendation is to avoid tap water. It's simply too unpredictable to know what's in your water unless you pull a water test or report. The mineral content in the water can greatly impact its flavor, mouthfeel, and even the general fermentation health. You can technically make good beer with tap water, but you'll definitely want to add a Camden tablet. This kit actually comes with one, and it'll help to wipe out the chloramines in the water that can leave your beer with a plasticky, almost band-aid flavor. No thanks. Something you don't want in beer. So what I recommend you do instead is head to the grocery store and just buy some spring water. Its mineral content is much lower, and it'll give you the clean slate needed to make a clean tasting beer. Start by heating up the water to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Brewing beer can be messy, especially if you have a boil over. So I decided to brew this one outside on the burner of my grill. But you could totally do this in your kitchen. It's just much riskier. And your significant other will thank you. Trust me. Once the water is to temp, it's time to add the specialty grain bag. Inside this cloth bag is some caramel 40 malt. And what this will do is add a depth of sweetness, flavor, and a bit of color to the finished beer. By steeping grains at warm temperatures, it helps extract those fermentable sugars flavors, and color to the water. Basically like making a big batch of tea. And you'll see how quickly it can happen. Typically we try and mash between a certain temperature range, usually between 148 to 156 degrees Fahrenheit. And we'll leave the grains in the hot water for anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes, maybe even longer. This gives it enough time to get all that goodness out. For this recipe, we're just adding in the bag right when we get to 160, turn off the heat, add the bag, and then add the lid to keep the temp stable. Then just let it steep for 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, safely pull up the bag, helps to have some tongs or a spoon or something, and now prepare to add the dry malt extract. Be warned, once the heat or water comes in contact with the stuff, it gets very, very sticky. Even a little steam can make this dry malt clump up into a mess. Another one of the reasons why we're outside. With the heat still off, slowly add it in and then give it a stir. I have a big spoon, but any spoon will work. Even a whisk would work great. Give it a really good mix to ensure it's fully dissolved we don't want any clumps at the bottom that will stick together and burn, giving your beer a nasty, scorched flavor. It might take a few minutes to get it fully dissolved, but once it is, it's time to turn back on the heat and bring to a boil. This is where you need to keep a close eye on the pot. Now that we have the malt extract in there, you're very likely to get a boil over if you're not careful. If you notice it's about to boil over, kill the heat immediately. Or you can try this trick I learned, where you take some water in a spray bottle and spritz the top as it rises. This should keep the foam in check, and after a few minutes of careful watch, you'll hit the hot break, which is basically where the foam finally falls down and it'll just boil normally. Now you can take a deep breath. With a rolling boil, it's time to add the hops. Hop flavor, aroma, and bitterness contributions are greatly impacted on when you add them to the boil. The longer you boil, the more bitterness you'll get. The less you boil them for, the more aroma you might get out of them. So for every recipe, step one is to start a timer. We'll boil for 60 minutes. So this recipe calls for a few additions. 
which will give this beer a more complex hop presence. Starting with the 60 minute addition of 3 grams of citra hops. This is where a scale comes in handy to measure out the precise amounts needed. Just drop the hops in and keep an eye on the boil. Sometimes it might foam up a bit with this first hop addition. Since these hops are boiling for 60 minutes, they'll give us most of the bitterness. And it should really be smelling like beer now. The next hop addition comes with 15 minutes left in the boil, 8 grams of citra hops. And then the last addition comes at the end of the boil. Turn off the heat and add the remaining 18 grams of hops. This is typically called a flame out addition. And since we're not boiling these hops, we should preserve more of the delicate flavors and aromas. Now it's time to chill, but our work's not done. What I mean is that we need to chill this wort down to yeast pitching temps. The yeast that will convert the sugars in the wort into beer through fermentation only work in a certain temperature range. If the wort is too hot, it'll likely just kill the yeast. So we'll want to chill this down to below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I found that the sweet spot for most ales is around 67 degrees. And there's a few ways to chill it down. First is to just let it sit with a lid on overnight. But that comes with the risk of infection from wild bacteria and yeast if you're not careful. More on that in a sec. You could also try sticking it in the fridge for a couple hours if you got the space. But the fastest way would be to make an ice bath in your sink and set the pot in it. You should get down to the right range within an hour if not less. One important thing to know is that after the boil ends, the beer is susceptible to infections which can easily ruin your beer. I know from experience. Many of my early batches didn't turn out great because I ignored this. So what this means is that nothing should touch your wort unless it's been sanitized. Thankfully this kit comes with these two vials. One is a cleaner, which is a powerful product that can remove beer gunk from fermenters or kettles. We don't need to worry about this right now, but it'll come in handy later. And the other is a sanitizer. When this sanitizer is mixed with water, it creates a solution that is very acidic and will help kill wild bacteria or yeast that might be living on a surface. One tip that I have is for you to mix it with some water in a spray bottle. This makes spraying down and sanitizing surfaces really easy. Just give it a spritz, wait a few seconds for it to work its magic, and then you can use it. Note that the sanitizer only works well if the surface is already clean, but this spray bottle trick has made brewing a lot easier for me. So back to the ice bath. Be careful not to let any water in. Putting the lid on will help with that. Then just add more ice as it melts. You can help speed up the process by stirring the wort occasionally with a sanitized spoon to disperse the cooler wort around. And don't forget to sanitize your thermometer if you stick it in the wort. Once it's chilled down to around 67 degrees Fahrenheit, it's time to add it to the fermenter. Assembling this fermenter was pretty easy. You just need to add the spigot, which is one thing I really love about this fermenter. A lot of beginner kits come with a glass carboy or buckets without spigots, which means you'll need an auto siphon to get the beer out, and that can be pretty annoying and potentially risky for your beer. So a spigot makes getting the beer out later a lot easier. With the fermenter assembled, make sure to sanitize it first by adding water and the sanitizer together. You can do it right in the fermenter and give it a good shake with the lid on. I even saved some of the sanitizer from this into a bottle for later use. And then just dump it out. With it sanitized, you can now add in the chilled wort. Since we boiled the beer for a while, we had some of the wort boil off, reducing the volume. So at this point, just top up with a little more water to the 1.25 gallon mark. The added 0.25 gallons will give us some extra space, since there will likely be some troub left behind at the end. Troub is just a bunch of proteins, hot matter, or even yeast that will fall out of suspension to the bottom and take up space. And we don't want that in our final product. Just the good stuff. Now finally we can add the yeast. Sprinkle it on and close up the lid. Give it a good shake, covering the hole with a sanitized hand or bung for about 60 seconds. Shaking aerates the warp which brings in oxygen to help the yeast perform. Oh, bung you ask? These two parts are the bung and the airlock. The airlock fits into the bung, and together it goes on top of the fermenter, creating a tight seal. Fill up the airlock with some of that leftover sanitizer. If you've never seen an airlock, it helps to keep things from getting into your beer, but since fermentation creates CO2, it also gives it a way to escape, so the fermenter doesn't explode under pressure. And with that, brew day is done, and beer is on its way. Not too bad, just a few steps to follow. Set the fermenter in a cool dark place. Cool as in below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to keep the fermenter temperature somewhat in check, otherwise you might get some off flavors from hot, overstressed yeast. And darkness is important because sunlight is the enemy of hops. If you've ever tasted a skunked beer, it's because the beer was exposed to the sun. And it's not really a good thing, unless you like Heineken. <laughs> Kidding. But just set it in a cold closet. The important thing for you to do now is just wait. It can take about a week or more for the beer to fully ferment and resist the urge to open it up. This can lead to all kinds of issues, one of them being oxidation. At the beginning of the fermentation, we need oxygen to help the yeast perform. But once the fermentation is going, 
and through the rest of the process, we want to avoid oxygen exposure at all costs. This is where I would say 90% of new brewers mess up. Okay, I totally made that set up, but I'm guessing a majority of new brewers don't really realize how badly this can mess up your beer. Oxidation leads to stale flavors. Some even say a cardboard-like flavor. Or it can make your beer sickly sweet and turn it a weird shade of purple. It's basically death to your beer, so just don't open it. Let the yeast do the work, watch the CO2 bubble out of the fermenter, in a week or so, you'll notice that the bubbles will stop coming. That's how you know you're just about done. It's very important not to rush fermentation. If you'd want, I'd say you can let this sit for about two weeks to be sure. If you rush and your fermentation is not done, that can lead to bottle bombs later. One piece of equipment that's not included in this kit is a tool to help precisely tell when fermentation is done, and that's a hydrometer. They're fairly cheap, so if you think you'll do this more than once, it might be worth picking one up. A hydrometer measures the density of a liquid, or how much sugar is in it. By taking a sample of the wort before fermentation, and then another one at the end of fermentation, you can determine how much alcohol is in the beer as well. The way it helps determine if your fermentation is done is by taking a reading a few days in a row once you notice the bubbling stops. If the reading is consistent, then you're likely done fermenting. If it changes, then there's still a little more to go. But since this kit doesn't come with one, that's why you'll see the instructions recommending giving it a full two weeks to ferment. Either way, that day will finally come. And when it does, it's time to bottle it up. This process involves filling up the bottles with a little extra sugar and then capping them. By adding more sugar, we'll restart fermentation in the bottles, which will create more CO2, which means pressure in the bottles and eventually bubbles when we open it up. If you get the bottling kit from Climber, it really simplifies this for you by giving you a set of bottles, caps, the crimper, and even some of these awesome priming sugar tablets that are pre-portioned for the bottles. Before we fill them, we need to sanitize the bottles and caps. If you got the spray bottle sanitizer, it will make quick work of this. Or you can just fill up a bucket or your kettle with some sanitizer and dunk them all in. Into each bottle, drop in four sugar tablets. It helps to remove the airlock so there's not negative pressure on the fermenter. This kit also comes with a bottling wand and some tubing. The bottling wand has a spring-loaded tip that when you press it into the bottle, it allows the beer to flow through, and when you let go, it stops. This is helpful so you don't make a mess in between bottles. But if you didn't have this, you could either just use a piece of tubing and crimp it between the bottles, or just fill it from the spigot. But that can lead to oxidation, so probably best to just use a bottling wand. Plus, the bottling wand leaves the perfect amount of headspace. You want about an inch or two of headspace from the top. It'll help with consistent carbonation later. Whichever way you do it, make sure to have some towels around because it can get messy. And once you get them all filled, add a cap on top and crimp it down. This bottle capper has a magnet that helps with alignment. You just go slow and give even pressure on both sides. You don't need to crank it down, just enough to make a tight seal. Test it by moving around and then place the finished bottle into the box. Now that we're done with bottling, it's a good idea to quickly talk about cleaning. You'll probably notice that your fermenter might be a bit nasty looking. This is where that other bottle of cleaner comes in handy. What it is, is a strong brewery wash that's specifically formulated to handle beer mess. So grab a good sponge and mix it up with some hot water and it'll make quick work of the tough stuck on stuff. The more you brew, the more you realize that cleaning is actually kind of a big part of brewing. But if you take care of it now rather than later, it'll be a lot easier since it won't be caked on. Okay, enough of the boring stuff, back to the bottles. Carbonation takes two full weeks to reach its peak, which I know can seem like forever after all that work. And that's part of the reason many brewers that continue in the hobby go on to kegging. It's faster to fill one keg versus many bottles, and you can get to full carbonation in half the time, sometimes even a few hours if you do some tricks. I got a whole video on kegging if you ever get to that point, but for a beginner, bottling is the way. That long wait makes it all worth it in the end. And if you did everything right, you should end up with something like this. I'm pretty happy with this little kit. It has everything you need to get started. And the beer is a lot better than I remembered my first one being. Albeit, I have some experience now, but hopefully I can share some bits of wisdom to help you on your first brew as well. I'll leave a link to this Clawheimer kit in the description if you're interested in picking one up. And the best part is you can take this kit and continue to brew and grow and expand to hopefully make even better beer or other fun fermentations moving forward. And if you need ideas, then I got the perfect video of the three easiest fermentations for any beginner to try. Check it out. Cheers and happy brewing.